Georgia voters are facing a deadline today to register for the upcoming high stakes runoff elections. The January 5th contest will decide control of the Senate. Democrats need to win both seats for the majority, while Republicans need just one. Two debates were held last night for the candidates, and everyone participated except for incumbent Republican Senator David Perdue. Senator Kelly Leffler and challenger Raphael Warnock debated a number of topics, including how to handle COVID-19 economic relief. Well, I was pleased to support all the relief packages this spring when we were addressing this virus, over $3 trillion of relief to Americans. And in fact, I voted twice on the Senate floor in recent months to support a package that Democrats have blocked that Nancy Pelosi has now confirmed that it was uh, a playing politics uh, with Americans' lives and livelihoods. Our frontline workers, our teachers, our police officers, uh, our health professionals, uh, need PPE, uh, our workers need relief, and we need to begin even now, I think, thinking beyond how we survive this pandemic and begin to think about how we survive on the other end of the pandemic. So Lecrae Mitchell covers Georgia for our political unit and joins uh, me now. Uh, Lecrae, we will get into how one candidate ended up debating an empty podium in a minute. But um, let us talk about sort of the biggest takeaways. What else did we learn about the two candidates' plans to fight the pandemic? What were your big tick takeaways from this debate? So as you heard, even in that soundbite that you all just played, the coronavirus, the handling of the coronavirus and economic relief was an important issue that continued to be brought up in both debates, particularly during the second portion of the Leffler-Warnock debate when they were able to ask you each other questions, that was a question that Warnock brought up to Leffler. You know, why didn't you support additional relief? And what you found is that Leffler continued to defend sort of the actions that she's already taken and the relief packages that she says she has, you know, rallied for. Other important points, though, outside of the coronavirus and something that we will continue to hear about because it's such a big issue, it's just the process in the state, the election process and trusting that process. You heard Leffler throughout the night talk about the importance of Georgians being able to believe that their, vo their vote will be counted. You had her, she was asked, you know, whether or not, straight out, did President Trump, did she believe that the claims that he has made about how things were handled in Georgia in terms of the election, are they true? And, you know, she found herself having to sort of defend his right to be able to challenge the process, but also coming along, like I said, and really making that point that it's important for Georgians to be able to trust this process. Other than that, another takeaway is just that what you found is a lot of rehashing of some of the same issues that we've seen brought up in these negative ads that have been taken out. You know, you had Reverend Warnock having to, again, reiterate and put into context a sermon that has become a talking point for Leffler about him not supporting military and God and him having to put that sermon in context and talk about how it was more about moral foundation and he quoted the scripture that it came from. And so it was a lot of defending of records um, throughout the night, which also was something that I'm sure Georgia voters were listening to to drive home points for them. And I believe that, you know, it, it was a time for the candidates to really drive home their points for their bases, um, hoping to hopefully grab some people in the margins as well. So why didn't Senator uh, David Perdue participate in this? That was something that you had his challenger talk about right off the bat. You know, at one point he said that, um, and this is a paraphrase, uh, you had Osaf say that Senator Perdue was not here today because the senator feels entitled to the votes of Georgia. To, to, to Georgian voters um, votes. And what we heard last month is that you had the Purdue campaign come out and say pretty early on that the senator would not be participating in a debate. Um, at the time in that statement, they said that he had 
he had won during the general election. They said that because he was able to garner 88,000 or so more votes than um, his challenger, he, he didn't necessarily need to prove anything and that it was a matter of getting people back out. But like I said, you know, what you had last night and what Ossoff was able to do because he was not in attendance is really make an argument to, like you said, an empty podium. He didn't have anyone challenging him on the points that he was able to drive home. And he said that uh, Senator Perdue's attendance or not being in attendance had more to do with his arrogance and entitlement than anything else. I think the other thing to just mm -hmm. keep in mind, though, is that you have these candidates. They have been having campaign events still. They have been going out and being able to rally their base. And so I would imagine that the Purdue campaign feels like what they weren't able to say on the debate stage last night, they've been able to say on the trail and will continue to be able to say on the trail in these coming weeks. Mm, so other than sort of pointing out that his opponent um, didn't wasn't at this debate, what other points did Ossoff try to make? How is he trying to sort of differentiate himself from uh, Senator Purdue? Similarly to Warnock, you heard him hit home about the importance of economic relief and needing to rush financial assistance to families that are suffering during this time due to the pandemic and businesses that are suffering as well. He also talked about climate change and the importance of appropriating funds for clean energy. He had a question about immigration. He was, he was able to make the point that he feels that comprehensive immigration reform needs to be passed. And then also, again, he was able to, again, the, the big thing is he was able to really drive home some of these kitchen table issues that we talk about, immigration, climate change, without anyone there to check anything that he was saying in terms of his opponent. And, and that really gave him the free space to be able to talk about some of his plans um, at least at length in terms of how long this debate was, the, the time that was appropriated for the debate. So those were some of the issues, immigration, climate change, but really that economic relief for families and businesses who have been suffering during the coronavirus was something that he spent some time on as well. So we mentioned uh, right before we threw to you that uh, today's the last day to register for this runoff election. The candidates really have a job ahead of them. They have to keep the momentum going among voters after, you know, we already went through a general election. We're seeing COVID numbers spike again, even higher than they were before um, the election in November. And so what are they doing? What are these candidates doing to make sure that their voters actually vote? It's all about turnout, and you're going to continue to hear me say that and others because this runoff is going to be about who can get their base back out and who can get some of these key voting blocks that may be in the margins when there isn't a lot of space because most people are decided at this point. You know, you mentioned the coronavirus and as of now, according to the state's public the Department of Public Health, there are more than 400,000 cases in the state at this moment. And so that's a topic that can't be ignored because it's something that is just so all encompassing, impacting so many people in the state and in the country. The other thing, though, is that and we've done done stories on this at this point. Some of those you know, the, the virtual campaign events that we continue to see them do, like we saw during the general election, getting out on the actual trail. You know, you had the president in the state over the weekend. I believe we're going to continue to see some of, on both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans, from other states even, coming into the state, trying to rally enthusiasm and momentum for these candidates because everyone knows it's all about turnout. And with, for the Republicans, you're going to continue to hear them really try to make this argument about unity and that is in no small part due to because of some of the messaging that we're hearing from the Trump campaign about how the general election was handled so you're having Republicans in the state having to remind each other hey we're on the same team here right now our enemy is the Democrats and that's what we need to be focused on going into the Senate runoff. Just really quickly, uh, President Trump was in Georgia. Do state uh, l Republicans think that the president is, is helping or harming their efforts there? You'll see that even when Senator Leffler was asked about that during the debate last night, it seems that Republicans are 
when asked that question, they respond by saying the president has the right to challenge the process. He has the, you know, it is well within his right to ask for the recount as he had. But what you also then hear them turn around and say is, hey, we have to make sure that Georgia voters feel like they can trust this process, this election process, because they understand the danger of people feeling like the process is in jeopardy or that their vote may not be counted is that they may not come out to vote. And Republicans don't want to see that happen either. Last week, you had a handful, more than a dozen of Republican, former elected officials, Republican officials in the state um, and party leaders in the state come together and pen an open letter calling for unity amongst Republicans in the state ahead of this Senate runoff. And I think what we'll continue to hear is just, look, there's a lot of money that's been spent on this race. As of now, according to Kantar CMAG data, we have more than $356 million that have, that's scheduled to be spent by candidates and outside groups in this race from the November 3rd general through the Senate runoff. This is an important race. It's going to be something that we continue to talk about. And what Republicans know, as, as well as everyone else, is that they need people to turn out and people feel more willing to do that when they think their vote is going to be counted. And so the president's messaging mm -hmm. on this, what you've, what you've seen Republicans do is, I believe, in an effort not to discredit what he is well within his right to do, um, they also don't want that to come off as, hey, something didn't go right with the elections in the state because they don't want people to distrust right. the process. All right. Uh, Lecrae, thank you so much. Thank you.